So a really short introduction. About 22 years ago, a PhD student decided to start procrastinating on his PhD dissertation and uh, play with a language called Python and make it uh, with a better interactivity interpreter. And today we're all here. Uh, welcome to the person without whom none of this would be, uh, Fernando Perez. Merci, Mathias. Hi, everyone. Um, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been an awesome conference. Um, it's, um, <clears throat> I've, I've really enjoyed kind of seeing what the community is doing and the, the, the amount of creativity and impact um, that is coming out of this community is, is kind of inspiring. Uh, a very quick bit of background, a kind of context. My, some of the roles that I play today in the project. Uh, I'm a member, I'm one of six people in the Executive Council. Those of you who saw our talk yesterday um, heard a little bit about that. Um, I work at UC Berkeley as a professor and I have to teach courses uh, that are data science related and use Jupyter intensely. That's a classroom where I teach uh, a course that typically has an enrollment of about 1,200 students, only about 750 fit in the room. Um, and I am a co-founder of an organization called 2i2c that you may have heard about already. Um, and with that organization, we partner on uh, the support of infrastructure for research in cryosphere sciences, because my domain-specific research, the kind of work that my PhD students do these days, is kind of at the intersection of statistical methods, statistical modeling, and machine learning applied to the earth sciences, uh, where there are physical constraints, but in the context of sort of questions in cryosphere research. So, and that, and so in, in one way or another, as an educator, as a scientist, or as a community member, Jupiter plays, uh, plays uh, kind of a role in my life. But I'm not speaking with any authority today. This is kind of a chance for me to reflect a little bit from a personal perspective. And so I'm only giving effectively opinions with the weight of no authority other than I believe in these things and I have some experience. Um, so for a bit of personal context, um, I'm Colombian. Um, I was born and raised in Medellin, Colombia, a city in the mountains uh, that today is kind of a destination. But if, uh, if you saw Narcos on Netflix seasons one and two, um, you may have heard a little bit about it. Um, that, was, that was my life, right? I was a teenager when Pablo Escobar was killed uh, on the roof of the house where he was hiding about 10 minutes from my place. Um, this was, uh, I was, trying to become a scientist as an undergraduate student in the context of a lot of violence, um, a lot of hardship, um, trying to work on problems at the intersection of computing and physics. Um, at the time, using Maple, I learned about not notebooks, not from Mathematica, but from Maple. Um, and this idea of working in an environment where you have you interact with, with mathematics, and then you generate code, and I would generate C++ to then out of the for the symbolic formulation of the problems I was working on, um, th that was already motivating me. That, that's kind of the kind of work that I was doing as an undergrad. Um, but uh, at the end, right before I went to grad school to, uh, to do my PhD in the US, I had the opportunity to teach some computational physics in Colombia in 1994 without access to Maple, to Mathematica, to MATLAB, to IDL. None of these things were really easily available as a teaching tool. I had a pirated copy of Maple for myself. That's what we did in Colombia. But, uh, but as infrastructure, these things were inaccessible to those in a country like Colombia. And open source software was the solution. So with duct tape and bubblegum wrappers, a friend was into Linux at the very earliest days of Linux. He got it running on a machine. Vax that had graphical terminals that was used as a remote terminal for the for eight students to be able to sit in and teach uh, and access a uh, GNU plot uh, and a C compiler to be able to do computing. Um, it was terrible. It worked in the sense that it showed me that these tools could lower these barriers at the t at the same time. The students couldn't think about physics because they got lost in error messages and pointers and technology, and so. All of these topics matter to me in that they, they kind of motivate a lot of what I've done in this community. Um, I moved to the US, to the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, to uh, do a PhD in physics. That's where I met Brian. So Brian and I met on the first day of grad school. I don't have pictures of us from grad school those day, in those days. We didn't have phones with cameras in our pockets. Um, I spent a lot of time probably doing things other than physics that are a lot of fun in Colorado, but that don't lead to a PhD. 
and I had a terrible crisis. Uh, eventually, my PhD advisor fired me on the fifth year of my PhD, uh, which as a foreign student in the United States is a really bad career move to get fired on your fifth year of your PhD um, because you're two weeks from deportation, basically. So not a great career move, not a great way to go. Um, I was saved by his colleague, uh, Anna Hasenfratz, a wonderful mathematical physicist who said, help me finish this project uh, that I was doing in IDL uh, and, uh, and we, can, uh, we, can try, we can try to get you graduated somehow. Um, the guy who fired me happened to be kind of the resident, uh, resident difficult person, let's call it, since this is being recorded in the department. Um, but in that crisis, again, open source saved me in that I got hooked on writing code um, and it gave me kind of a path forward that kind of tied a number of these motivations, right? Uh, the idea of doing research with tools that I could share equitably with my mentors back in Colombia. Um, the idea that people wanted to work, that when I put some code out on the internet, people said, this is cool, let me help you. Change my own psychological outlook in the middle of that crisis. The idea that science should be done openly and not with proprietary expensive tools that we're not allowed to understand, which to me was epistemologically absurd. Uh, and ultimately the idea that it was fun, that Python was just this cool tool that it was fun to play with. Um, so I, dis I disappeared from this lovely advisor, Anna Hasenfratz, for an afternoon, and we're, we're, we're still here uh, 20 some years later, to create IPython 001, which is there. That never went, went public. I put that on GitHub uh, much later. But, uh, but after about six weeks of work, I did put out the first public version of IPython. There, there's, there's a re record on the Compliant Python archives. But what I want to highlight is that this was not my work. Even the very beginning of IPython was already a community effort. Because I had done a little bit of code in my own, in my crisis, in my desperation. And I read about, on a blog post, about something called um, Interactive Python Prompt, written by a German oceanographer called Janko Hauser. And then about another project called Lazy Python, written by a grad student at Caltech called Nathan Gray. And I emailed both of them and said, hey, these things you're doing are kind of similar to the SciPython thing that I've been playing with. Do you want to get together and, and work? And both of them more, more or less sent me the same email verbatim. I'm too busy right now, other stuff to do, but please use my code, do whatever you want with it, go for it, that's great. They were supportive, they, they didn't have time, but they were supportive, they gave me, they were generous with their code. So from the very start, IPython wasn't about me, it was about people sharing their work and doing things together. Um, Brian, which as I mentioned, was my friend from graduate school, reconnect, kind of connected with IPython development around 2004, 2005, and Without Brian, this would not exist. Uh, and Brian brought along for the ride Min Reagan Kelly, who at the time was, I believe, Min, you were, I think, in the early semester, in the early time part of your uh, physics undergraduate training. Uh, Brian was a professor in physics at Santa Clara University. Min was an undergraduate there. Min is today one of the leaders in our community, scientist um, at uh, Simulai Research Lab in Oslo. Um, and without them, uh, without the work that, the foundational work that they did and the foundational relationships that we built for this project, uh, this, wouldn't, uh, this wouldn't exist. And this grew into a community. This is Matthias uh, in 2013. Jess Hamrick, who's now, who was at Berkeley, a grad student, who deployed the first instance of a really large cloud-hosted course um, at Berkeley that what begat these 1,200, 2,000 student courses that we have now. She's now a researcher at DeepMind. Um, this picture from a few years ago, interestingly, has a lot of faces, and I have versions of this picture from a couple, even from a, one or two years earlier, and it's interesting to see that the vast majority of these faces are still here, and actually most of the, the executive committee is there. So in summary, you've all seen, probably most of you have seen this picture, but this is true for me in a very, very real sense, in that I, I probably wouldn't be here, I might not be personally okay if it hadn't been for open source and for the values and the spirit of collaboration and working together that open source kind of gave me. Um, it lowered barriers for, for me to do physics, to access graduate school, to do my work, but also personally to be able to kind of move forward. Um, so thank you, because today I'm fine. Like I'm not in a crisis. I'm a tenured professor at UC Berkeley. I'm a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, I'm doing fine. I, I'm very happy with what I do. I mean, 
every job has its problems, but I have a lovely position that allows me to focus on science and education, the things that motivate me in one of the best places in the world, and I owe that to people like you. Some of you are in this room, the pictures, some of you have been working on this for 20 years. Brian couldn't make it uh, on this trip, and the rest of you are doing that work today. Um, and this is part, partly me expressing gratitude, because yesterday you heard about a transition in our governance model to an executive council and the structure that we described. Um, hopefully we motivated it reasonably well. And uh, I want to kind of reflect on the fact that the old governance model that we had on paper had a term that we borrowed from the Python community, this um, term, the BDFL, that I was the benevolent dictator for life. Um, and at least I want to signal for a moment that it, that term not only did it not describe actually what happened in, in our community in Jupiter, but it's also, I don't think, a good model for thinking about how to grow healthy communities. And Python has moved on from that model. We did too, um, let alone the fact that in, in a world like today where there are actual dictators waging war um, on democracies, I really don't want to be attached to that letter even as a joke. Um, but more importantly, that I think that model is a model that is not a healthy model for building collaborative teams. There's this great article called Time to Say Goodbye to Our Heroes, which is about kind of the, this hero, the, the big PI, the big important professor model of academic science um, that uh, I found out about from a tweet thread from Ryan Abernathy, uh, the lead of the Pangeo Project, who was reflecting on it. Um, and even though some of you are in academia, many of you are not, you're in industry, I think, I think the same ideas apply, at least in the context of building communities and leadership. Um, and uh, so I'll share the links to the slides after, um, if anyone is interested, um, because I, I really think that we, we need to kind of embrace this idea that we have to work on our models of growth and leadership that move the spotlight away from any single individual and instead allow us to create healthy uh, communities while still obviously supporting creativity, individual motivations uh, for contributions, etc. cetera. Um, whoops. So the context where this is happening now is one where, well, we won, right? 20 years ago, people did, my, my mentors did tell me that I was crazy and that I was throwing away what, what little career I might have by doing this open source stuff. Um, and today, sure, all of industry source, the biggest tech companies in the world uh, are doing open source in science, right? Uh, there's a program called Transform to Open Science that Shel Genteman, an oceanographer, who left, stopped using proprietary tools and went on to using Python because she started working with Pangeo and, with, uh, with, and found a healthy community in Pangeo that was welcoming, right? And then shifted her research tooling from proprietary tools to, uh, to the open source Python stack and then decided that she actually knew enough about policy making at NASA and kind of how the gears turn in the federal government to create a program to move NASA towards open science, um, which then led to NASA declaring 2023 as the year of open science for all of NASA. And then to coordinate with the White House Office and of Science, of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, which is the, for those of you not in the US, it is the office in the United States that coordinates science policy across agencies. It's, it's, not, an office, it's not an office that funds anything specific, but it coordinates the United States kind of federal science programs. Um, and so now there is open.science.gov where you can find how the, the specific policy documents that where all the federal agencies are declaring 2023 as the year of open science um, and where they're defining if you want to get funding from pretty much any federal agency in the US, this is how you have to do it. And it turns out that if you go and read documents like SPD 41A, which is the NASA science policy document 41A, the, 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 the federal regulations for getting funded by NASA these days, it's the kind of thing that freaks like us would have written 10 years ago. It talks about community governance. It talks about openness throughout. It's not about somewhere at the bottom of your paper, tell people that if they email you, you'll send them a zip file. That does not cut it anymore. This was done thoroughly and consistently, and this is a huge change. And after doing it in the US, they're working to make this global. So in July of this year, in a couple of months, um, NASA and CERN are hosting a week-long summit working with UNESCO and the European Commission 
to push these ideas of open science globally. Um, and this ties then into kind of my next topic, which is that, yes, this is working, but open science is not just about, well, I could get Linux and use it and solve my problem of not having money in Colombia to pay for MATLAB or Mathematica or Maple or IDL. For me, the and, and even though it, that was valuable, I don't think that's sufficient. What was transformative, at least for me in my life, was the fact that I could participate, I could be an equal actor in the process with others, and ultimately that I could have leadership um, and that I could grow into thinking about what is it that we want to do. Not simply that I could consume for free things that I didn't have access to. And so this is a discussion that now is taking place in many, in many places. Um, these are a couple of images from uh, a summit that was held at an event on, on scientific open source software run by the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative uh, in Santa Clara last, in Santa Rosa, I'm sorry, uh, last September. Some of you in the room were there. You may remember this wonderful discussion. Um, after this, uh, or concurrent with this, Laura Acion from Metadocencia in Argentina, Gonzalo Peña Castellanos, um, from Quonsite and myself worked on writing a little blog post about open science in Latin America and what will it take to really push these ideas. Not that there are no people working on that, but connecting the work and the leadership that's coming from these projects in, in, in our countries, in the global north. I'm Colombian, but prof my professional network is, is these days in the US, obviously, connecting this with activities in Latin America so that open science is not just accessible to all, but is owned by all, and all have an opportunity for leadership. Um, so the next thing that I kind of want to mention then is how I want, how much I want our community to really think beyond, I'm, I love being here, I partly grew up in Paris as a child, this specific museum has been a, a, a constant reference of mine for coming, so I'm delighted to be, to be here and I love it. But I want us to think about how do we bring these tools and these ideas beyond the global north, beyond Europe, beyond North America, etc. Damian Avila from the Jupiter team and from 2I2C a couple of years ago, or a few years ago, I think this was pre-pandemic, organized um, a Jupiter community workshop in South America. Um, just two weeks ago, I was in Buenos Aires uh, where uh, Meta Docencia was part of another, now, uh, now a larger event run by Chen Zuckerberg on open science in Latin America. Um, these are pictures from a couple of weeks ago with Damian and Laura and yesterday en español, con colombianos y argentinos, vamos a trabajar en precisamente tratar el año entrante de, de, de impulsar algunas de estas ideas de la ciencia abierta y de Júpiter en el contexto de Colombia, de la Argentina, de México. Invito a los latinoamericanos que hay aquí a que conversemos. Um, I'm going to be on sabbatical, um, and next year, the main topic of my sabbatical is precisely going to be to try to work on building capacity for usage in science with a focus on Earth and the environment and capacity building hopefully for leadership in Latin America. So I've already had a chance to meet some new faces and talk to some of, some of you from that space and hopefully uh, I'll get to talk to others. So switching gears, another topic that's in my mind kind of as, as we make these transitions is obviously AI. Um, we wrote, uh, uh, Brian and I had a chance to write this article where we kind of put down some ideas about how do we think in Jupiter uh, about the notion of building a narrative where you have a thread that is code and a thread that is human language, right? And this kind of two double-stranded rope, um, which is embodied in practice and typically in notebooks, right? Um, this article was published um, in Computing in Science and Engineering, where Lorena Barba, who's in the room, uh, is editor-in-chief, and we were uh, delighted to receive uh, a little award. But that context is important when we think about AI, because at least the way I see it is generative AI tools have brought to the table a third partner, a third voice in that conversation, right? A notebook is a narrative where you write English, Spanish, French, your own language in Markdown, you execute code in Python, Julia, R, C++, whatever, and it's up to you to connect the two and, and speak about the results in the plot or describe the data or describe the algorithm. All of a sudden, we have this third element um, 
and there, this is all flagging only flagging only some of the work that, that folks in the community are doing. I am sure that many of you here are working on that. I saw, I, I saw in the program multiple other talks and, uh, and, uh, and projects that spoke about AI. I am not directly working on this. I mean, I, I, I spent like over Christmas one day doing, I wrote this little Jupiter uh, uh, toy, which was basically a magic to talk to, chat to, to GPT-3. Uh, but this morning I saw a great talk from David Q and Piyush Jain um, about the, the implementation in Jupyter AI. And hopefully this is a space where there will be many, many tools. But I hope this community comes to this table with the idea that we are very human centric. We want to think about the construction of these narratives in ways that are also fair, that are vendor agnostic, where we're not uh, prioritizing, where we're trying to empower the individuals who are working with their tools rather than simply funneling more power back to those who control the infrastructure. Um, very complicated topic, I know, it's super hot, it's big. This is just this, uh, a, a snippet of the kinds of things that are happening, uh, rather than trying to be comprehensive, but at least it was another one that I wanted to, to touch upon. And then, finally, um, what is Jupiter? So, it's not clear whether Jupiter has an actual core or not, right? That's open to debate in our community. Um, and I know that this is the one about the, the misspelled Jupiter that Elisa likes. Uh, but um, in, our, in our, oh, sorry, this has a little bit of, la uh, of latency. In our world, we often describe Jupiter as both a community and a community that is focused on creating tools. This is a wonderful diagram from uh, the Turing Way team that uh, many of us have used uh, in multiple contexts and I think captures really nicely kind of some ideas about the fact that our Jupiters does seem to have a core. It's a core made of people who are creative. Um, I think of it, and again, this is my perspective, but I think of Jupiter as a tool for kind of the whole life cycle of thinking in computing. In my case, it's research, but I think that even for those of you in industry and other spaces, there's a version of this that applies, that there's a kind of a cycle uh, uh, that, that you, we move through that involves exploring, collaborating, running code for real, kind of like in production, and at some point sharing outputs with others in, any, in, in, in a variety of ways. Um, and uh, I think for us in Jupyter, the idea of doing this, oh, a couple icons are not rendering well, that's weird. Um, the idea, sorry about that, I have no idea what, what happened there. Um, the idea for me of creating tools in this space is that precisely by all of them being open and modular and smooth, we can do what Elisa was talking about, which is that moving, this is not a ro uh, uh, something the where we move down in one direction until we get something out and published and we're done, for those of us who live in that world, uh, or you ship a product, but rather something where we can move back and forth. We can go from exploration to explanation was her context. Um, same here, right? And this goes to this idea, ideas of reproducibility, of open science, of allowing others to build upon this so that, our tools support this kind of creative and collaborative work um, in a fluid way. Um, so I want to leave that with kind of my perspective because I think the project is a shift in governance, a shift a kind of coming back from the pandemic, the explosion of AI, uh, a world which is cloud first uh, for many things, uh, is a world where the project kind of is, is, should think about it, it, where it goes next. The same ideas that led to our fantastic growth and impact from 10 years ago are not gonna be the ones that propel us forward today. Um, my focus these days, as I said, is more on research and education and some very specific collaborations in the project. So at least I wanted to leave us all thinking about where do we want to go? What is it that we do? Being cognizant of something like the innovator's dilemma. For those of you who don't know it, it's kind of a classic uh, in the business literature applied to tech and innovation and industry. We need to worry about that because we do have the trust of millions of users. We saw numbers yesterday from GitHub. Uh, many of you have built companies around that. You can't break the trust of your users or, or of your students or of your colleagues, right? But at the same time, we want to be creative. That tension is not an easy tension to navigate. Um, it's hard to navigate, it's even harder to navigate in a distributed community with global decision making where we want individuals to be as creative and empowered as the largest tech firms in the world. And we want everyone to contribute in a healthy way. Um, and even when that includes competition, 
And let's be realistic, there is competition uh, for resources in this world and in, in various kinds. Um, so I don't have answers to all of this, but I wanted to kind of present these perspectives on values um, while I say thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to the organizers, uh, as I said. Merci à l'équipe française. <laughs> C'est un rêve d'être ici. Uh, and, and to all of you, um, I hope to continue being involved with the project for a long time to, time to come, um, but I'm delighted that it's in a very different role, that it's in a role as uh, just one more amongst many, one more uh, with all of you. And uh, I look forward to chatting about this. I'm happy if to, I think there might be like time for maybe one question, uh, and, uh, but I'll, I'll be here this evening and tomorrow. So thank you, everyone. This is a dream. Uh, it's been a wild ride, and thanks to all of you for making it possible. <laughs> We, we do have time for one or two questions, and thank you for this three or quadrilingual talk, uh, like mm? Python, Python, French, English, and <laughs> Spanish. Uh, so come, come down if you have questions, or raise your hand, and I will bring you the mic for Fernando. No question? All right, um, let's hear about Lab 4 then. Yes. Uh, so please come. So what's... what's